think she is in Frankfurt in Sackenberger with 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 the uh, same project with uh, Hanya, if oh. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and you are back to China, Queen Yeah, yeah, I'm in yeah. Qingdao. Yeah, in 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 Qingdao. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, famous for is beer here. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. And the news is still in Napier. Yes. You enjoy you are you enjoying the New Zealand match, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah, we moved to here. It's very nice. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it's your office now. Yeah. Now you have your own your you have your own room. Yeah, that's not great. sharing space with not sh sharing space with <laughs> us. Okay, so you're one. You can start. Mm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Irawan. Currently, I work for the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Indonesia as a deputy director for the Greenhouse Gas Inventory. Previously, uh, I am a researcher at University of Auckland, uh, conducting my PhD with the, with the topic of uh, prioritization of marine prioritization of uh, of uh, uh, marine conservation in the coral triangle. So it's about the biodiversity using biodiversity criteria to identify areas with the most uh, 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 conservation value. And today we have a biodiversity Friday. I think it's really nice to have a biodiversity Friday and you can talk about biodiversity in, in, in general term or in the specific term. And uh, we are feel really happy today that we have uh, two uh, distinguished speakers from different from different regions of the world. One is uh, one is uh, Dr. Dinusa Jaya Chilake, and one is uh, Dr. King Shao Zhao from University uh, Ocean University of China. And let me introduce a little bit about the background of this our this uh, our two speakers today, Dr. Dinusa. Uh, Jaya Tilake will talk about her studies on identifying the distribution of marine biomes on global scale, especially focusing on seagrass and kelp communities. And now, Dr. Inusha, uh, she is a lecturer in the University of Eastern University of Technology in Napier, New Zealand. It's a nice place to, to be a lecturer. And then uh, and, uh, and conducting a research program on, on the freshwater ecology on Hawke's Bay region in New Zealand. The, the Dr. Jing Shao Shao will present uh, her, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, 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 his uh, research on, on, on mapping a marine ecosystem and biodiversity rich spot on global scale and in the West, West Pacific region. Uh, he is a, a lecturer or a faculty member of the Ocean University of China in Jingdao. And amazingly, he won the El Safer Atlas Award for, uh, for producing the most comprehensive and entirely data-driven prioritization of MPA for the world. Yeah, I think this, the, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Genusa Jayatilake because uh, ladies always first. So Genusa, you can, uh, you have the floors. Time is yours. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, my research is using marine biome maps to expand the marine reserve network. So before we go to talk about this research, I would like to give an um, introduction about myself. I born in Kia So I'm a Sri Lankan, live in New Zealand. And currently I'm working uh, for EIT as an environmental lecturer. I did my PhD in uh, 2020. Uh, completed my PhD in 2020 from the University of Auckland and my PhD title is Mapping Marine Biomes of the World. So today I'm going to focus on the fourth chapter of my PhD thesis is the, how these marine biomes can use to uh, demarcate or the delineate the marine protected areas. 
So before we talk about this uh, marine protection, I would like to talk about what is the biome. Is the biomes are large biogenic areas characterized by the same plant life form. So if you have seen a uh, look at this uh, left hand side, you, you may be familiar with this terrestrial biomes. Like they have three dimensional structure, permanent and temporal spatial distribution feeding, breeding, and nesting habitat for associate fauna. These biomes have unique plant uh, species as well as uh, unique uh, associate faunal communities. So uh, the second picture from the left hand side shows a savanna and the topmost picture of the map shows the distribution of savanna. And the, picture from the uh, left hand side shows a tropical rainforest biome and the bottom most one shows the distribu global distribution of these uh, tropical biomes. So this is the concept. It has large biogenic area and uh, the, you can see this the uh, middle picture shows they are totally different but they are terrestrial biomes. And so my PhD, what I wanted to introduce this concept to the marine domain and to see whether we can uh, identify a uh, similar pattern or the similar organization within the marine domain. Uh, for that, I use uh, four marine biomes, seagrass, kelps, mangroves, and susanthalate corals. Even though susanthalate corals are not plant-based, uh, um, uh, or the uh, community or the uh, habitat. Uh, I chose it because it follows all the other characteristic features like uh, three-dimensional structure, permanent and temporal distribution, uh, provide feeding, breeding and nesting habitats for the associate faunal communities. And even like you can uh, use um, uh, salt marshes as a biome, a kind of like an adjacent biome or the marginal biome, but the uh, salt marshes are more terrestrial than coastal. So I, I, I used only these uh, four biomes. So the next question is, is there any use of these biomes? And do we need to uh, you know, study or talk more about these biomes? So simply, uh, there are like lots of um, uh, socioeconomic uses of these biomes. Uh, for example, as a human food, we can eat fruits, seeds, seedlings, leaves, or many parts of the mangrove species. And uh, it's very, like, um, highly valued as tourism and aquaculture. Many countries uh, cultivate shrimps, uh, do the farming of shrimps, fronds, and cap for the fertilizer or the, uh, for other food commodities, uh, medicine, fisheries, housing materials, and even the interior decorative items and commercial products like as tannins, uh, uh, tannins soap, and um, cellulose acetate. So those things, uh, there are like lots of uh, economic uses. And the next question is, do they have any ecological or biological significances? The simple answer is yes. So here I uh, highlighted uh, few uh, ecological and biological significances according to the Arch Target 11, because um, I completed my PhD in 2020, and that is the cutoff year for the achievement of Arch Targets. So here I highlighted those targets parallel to my study. These uh, biomes have unique rare and endemic species, population or communities. Uh, for example, seagrasses, they're like a few, um, endemic species and all the biomes have endemic and rare species and they have populations and communities and are essential for associate faunal population to survive and grow. That's true. And contain species population or communities with high natural biological productivities. All these are plants or the photosynthetic or primary producers. So there is a high productivity. 
And blue carbon storage, when we talk about blue carbon, so sea grasses and mangroves come to the topmost um, uh, features and even kelp can absorb carbon dioxide and pass it through the um, uh, food webs. And the foundation species, as well as the ecosystem engineers, yes, they can change the environmental conditions and provide a very suitable, healthy environment for the other living organisms and shoreline protection. You can, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if I said a mangrove, the first thing is you can see a lot of uh, roots, nice roots protecting our shorelines. So sad scenario is, the anthropogenic and climate impact. Uh, so the, there are like lots of natural disasters can make harm to these uh, biomes. Storms, tsunami, diseases, grazing by herbivores. So these are natural disasters, but the worst case scenario is the human impact or the human disturbance, other than this listed uh, features or the list listed disturbances, the pollution, and artificial developments and any type of uh, disturbances done by human can cause a, a devastating or the degradation of these uh, biomes. So before I go on to talk about this uh, modeling process, the, my question was what we need to know and what, where are they exactly? and what we can do for the protection. So during this thing, many researchers and scientists uh, have done a lot of work for the um, uh, understand the biological, morphological, taxonomical, biochemical processes of this uh, marine plants. But we have a limited resources about the distribution, global distribution. This, uh, uh, the next question was how many uh, maps we can rely on or uh, what are the maps to be can use for this conservation processes. So there is a map for sea grasses that's accurate and like uh, I think uh, Frederick Schultz uh, map available on UNEP WZMC Ocean Data Viva. So this map is very uh, advanced, accurate, and hard uh, outcome of a hard work, but it's an incomplete because this is like real uh, polygons of the patches of sea grasses and the real occurrences. So it takes a long time to complete. And uh, so there will still, there are some places need to add more. And so my question is, like to get a kind of a complete map, can we do something else? And the kelp or the laminarian um, brown algae, we don't have any existing maps. For mangroves, we do have, it's a satellite image processed map from Giri at all uh, 2011 and a coral map also developed using as satellite images. So all these maps are available on UNIP WZMC Ocean Data Weaver. And all the authors, including myself, describe the limitations of these um, maps. So what did I do? I collected all the occurrence records and tried to develop a map, a modeled map, to predict the possible distribution around the world, including the countries um, <laughs> with limited interest of marine plants, or do they, they don't have uh, local maps. Also, all these countries covered depend on the other countries' available data. So I use Maxen model and um, 13 environmental variables available on GMED and uh, different uh, open uh, data sources such as GBIF and OBIS and UNEP WCMC occurrence records. And I cross validate this with um, Short's um, polygon layer 
to verify the prediction of the model. So nearly I used, uh, I uh, developed thousand trial maps to get the final map. So, and with this, um, to finalize, map is look like this. So it covers all the possible or the suitable environmental conditions to occur sea grasses. And the similar and the with experience of the seagrass biome, I developed the same too for the kelp biome to get an idea of the distribution of kelp. So this is version one. And later on with my supervisor, we developed again um, a regional map for the Arctic region. And the version two, we published it so in the version two, it has more uh, polygons and the Arctic region. And so the fourth chapter focused about the conservation of marine biomes. So uh, do we pay a really a considerable amount of attention to the conservation of marine plants? Or if, is it enough or do we need to do more? And where are we exactly? So the first uh, uh, step is to identify the current conservation status of marine biomes, forming species, uh, species uh, and the uh, IUC and red list. And the next one is the individual uh, area of distribution of seagrass, kelp, susantholite, coral, and mangrove biomes, according to the uh, exclusive uh, economic zones of each country, so, as well as uh, little biological regions. I divided these uh, biogeographical regions accord or the based on IUC and operational regions. So then that is easy to link to where do we need to focus more for the conservation. And then I did um, analysis to get the multiple biome occurrence within one kilometer, one kilometer pixel area, because all these uh, maps I do, uh, modeled is, has one kilometer, one kilometer resolution. So this is the maximum resolution. I think I could go during my PhD time. Uh, it's a global level. It's a very, uh, if I could go for 100 meter, 100 meter resolution, this would be more accurate, but it's really time consuming as well as stopped prematurely processing the models. So all these maps used for one kilometer, one kilometer resolution. And uh, I did the same uh, calculations for the uh, individual uh, ecological uh, EZ zones as well as IUCN operational regions. So this is the outcome of the, the, the individual plant species uh, conservation status. So have a look, so you can see the seagrasses are kind of like uh, out of uh, 60 species are used for my um, study. Uh, there is an attention a paid attention to understand the conservation status. So 45 is least concerned that there are uh, endangered species and vulnerable species, and uh, two species doesn't have any information. But uh, so the susanthalate corals also like have a, a uh, different uh, conservation status. And almost all of these uh, corals under protect with different um, uh, conservation uh, agreements and uh, different, um, uh, what do you call it? Some, um, yeah, it's a kind of like agreements from the different uh, uh, organizations and governments. And but the kelp is surprisingly all the 66 species, uh, only one species has record. And it, this, I'm talking about this in 2019 before I submit my PhD. Probably now they updated it later on. But the 66 species doesn't have any information. It's not uh, available on IUC and red list. So there must be some record, at least like data deficient or not 
<laughs> something like that. And so the mangrove species also, they have uh, endangered species, vulnerable species, and the least concerned species a lot. So this is the overall conservation states status of individual plants. But now the, the, the next step is, can we protect even it is not uh, individually assessed or not, can we protect it within a one a large area or can we demarcate the strict reserves to protect this, including the conservation, uh, despite of the conservation status. And so this is the um, map of the seagrass biome, the modeled map and the health biome map. And this is the uh, coral biome, coral map and the mangrove map. So what did I do? I overlapped all these four biomes and tried to see, is there any places with uh, multiple biomes? or the, what are the, the area of individual country has. So when I try to uh, do that, I found it's kind of like interesting when we talk about this Asian Pacific region. So the highest distribution of the seagrasses for the individual economy, exclusive economic zones, the Australia has the highest and um, following uh, USA and then Indonesia. And the kelp distribution is also the highest is in Australia and the following USA, UK, and then Japan. So the mangrove is again, it's uh, Indonesia and Australia. And so there's no wonder of the Susanthalate corals. So it's Indonesia, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Philippines. So this is, we can have a clue. So all these plant communities, we have high distribution of all these four biomes in Asian Pacific region. And when I uh, try to identify the number of the uh, biomes distributed within this uh, coastal regions. This is the area with one biome. So it's like almost all over the world, like it has one biome and at least uh, it's two biomes. So this is uh, one kilometer resolution, square kilometer resolution. So there's two biome areas. This within one kilometer, square kilometer, you can see two, two different types of biomes. And the interesting part is the three biomes. So some places you can see three different biomes within one kilometer. So you can see the, around this, uh, in the uh, Asian Pacific region, there are like lots of red color dots to show these places have multiple biomes. So uh, it's a ca calculation. So I think the Indonesia has the highest of the, the multiple biomes and uh, Philippines, New Guinea. So these are the countries, the topmost uh, three biome areas. And so the question is, do we have enough uh, protected areas to conserve or strict reserves to conserve these uh, the nice uh, uh, multiple habitats? Next one is to Three more see. Minutes, Sorry. Sorry? Three more minutes, three more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So the next one is to, I divided it into IUC and operational regions to see what it is and how, how is the distribution. Now you can see, even though there are like lots of species or the three biomes areas, some, some regions strongly, like we don't have um, enough um, IUC and 
conservation areas. You can see this uh, map shows, these are the existing uh, strict reserves, but it's uh, very rare or there's, there's, there are like lots of limited uh, places. This image shows some uh, strict reserves, like it's, it's not cover the coastal area, but some places like this, it covers nicely the, the coastal region. Some, some places like this, it covers. But here, this image shows, it's like there are, this red color shows the three biomes, but it doesn't cover the uh, three biome areas. So uh, this um, uh, table shows the uh, percentage cover within our uh, strict reserves. So it's mostly it's zero under the zero. So some of this, I think this is because of the uh, into the power two uh, square kilometers or so 100 kilometers uh, area, probably this has more like at least a one or two uh, strict reserves, but it's not sufficient. You can see there's like many of is under zero. So that means we need more marine reserves. So this is my suggestion. At least these countries should have uh, strict reserves to conserve there are multiple uh, biomes and because this multiple giving multiple biomes giving a protection to multiple biomes is not only conserving the plants it's conserving all the other um, ecological processes associate faunal communities and also the juvenile state status of the commercial fish, fish species so it's if you don't protect this or the, if you don't uh, pay your attention to conserve using strict reserves, this the harm is not only for the plants, it's for the, all the living beings of the marine domain. And also the, the other thing is, it's not just to quantity, the, the demarcate of marine protection protected areas is just a quantity. We need a qualitative uh, strict reserves to conserve more uh, species. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayatilaki. It's really nice presentation and I really enjoy your presentation, working from identifying the biome until the application of this analysis to develop the uh, I really like it. the strict marine biodiversity, strict uh, conservation area because yeah, most of our MPAs, uh, MPA, are, are although they are called MPAs, but without uh, limited protection. So, you, you, your research focus on we have to pro, we have to generate or develop the strict protected area. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next speakers will also will be the. Uh, 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 Parallel with this, uh, with Dr. D Dr. Dinusa's presentation, and Dr. King Shalzao will present how the global data set they use for uh, developing MPAs in the world. Okay, Dr. King Shao, the time is yours. Yeah. Uh, 20, yeah, okay. 20 minutes, Thank 25 you. minutes. Yep, it is. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, in, uh, Dr. King Shao. Okay, uh, can you see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, good day everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Chen Shui Zhao uh, from the Ocean University of China. Yeah, um, yeah, today um, I would like to uh, talk about uh, my recent work about uh, mapping uh, ecosystems and uh, biodiversity rich forests yeah, at a global scale and the uh, uh, the West Pacific on a regional scale. So uh, at first, I would like to uh, introduce some um, background and the motivation behind my uh, research. It was in uh, 2016, uh, the IUCN World uh, Conservation Congress called for the protection for at least 30% of uh, each uh, marine habitat and 30% of, of the ocean for an effective marine biodiversity conservation. And uh, 
uh, this goal was again reminded in the CBD's uh, 15th COP conference uh, last year. And uh, so uh, uh, for achieving the goal, uh, the percent uh, were, was is 7.7% uh, uh, this year and still far away from the goal in uh, 2030. So we would like to know uh, where we could expand the 30% coverage. So uh, in this presentation, I want to uh, yeah, uh, talk this topic from a global scale and uh, from a scope of a regional scale in the West Pacific. Uh, so uh, I, I did this research uh, in my uh, late PhD period and uh, uh, pub, uh, published a paper about uh, to prioritize the, uh, the biodiversity rich, uh, rich sports on a global scale uh, to include the uh, factors which can indicate different aspects of marine biodiversity as much as possible. Uh, yeah, uh, I tried to include the, uh, the ecosystems the uh, benthic river city, which can, uh, which is strongly correlated with uh, uh, species richness and uh, and about uh, and about diversity, and uh, also the uh, species richness and uh, the the balms, uh, which can serve um, a, a strong uh, biodiversity and uh, the realms of species admissity. And this work uh, was granted a um, um, paper award. It was uh, uh, granted the, uh, the Atlas uh, reward by elsewhere for its contribution to the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goal uh, number 14, uh, marine life under sea, uh, life underwater, yeah. So uh, I, uh, I will introduce uh, each of the data layers I used in the prioritization analysis. Uh, the first group of uh, layers are the ecosystems I'm, uh, I mapped uh, in my earlier paper, uh, we, which is also a global scale work. Um, uh, it was based on an unsupervised cluster analysis of 20 physical, uh, biological, uh, uh, biochemical, and uh, nutrient variables. And uh, uh, some areas belonging to the same ecosystem were geographically divided by continents, but distributed at similar latitudes and symmetrically on both sides of the equator. Um, each of the ecosystems was represented by an individual uh, presence absence layer in the prioritization analysis. So that there were seven layers in total. Uh, to give some more technical details, uh, the, uh, the raw data, the uh, 20 environmental variables was, uh, were first normalized and then uh, um, principal component analysis uh, was conducted to reduce the number of variables uh, and uh, exclude the correlation between the variables and uh, the uh, k-means clustering analysis using cosine similarity as distance function to uh, uh, to to do the main analysis to uh, to identify and uh, to identify the, the ecosystems and the map layer distributions and finally the uh, mapping was uh, validated by the uh, set of values to uh, ensure the proper number of the ecosystems. Uh, that is, uh, uh, how many ecosystems should uh, should be on the world? Uh, the next groups of layers are the bounds and uh, uh, in this. Uh, uh, in this research, 
the BELMS uh, was defined as large geographic areas uh, characterized by the same plant form, which form uh, large areas of uh, three-dimensional habitats uh, with high primary productivity. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, Danisha, I can get the global uh, distribution of seagrass and uh, kelp. And I also collected the, uh, the, the distribution and the, of uh, mangrove and uh, the shallow water coral reefs from the uh, uh, same data set. Uh, specifically, um, yeah. yes, uh, the uh, shallow water coral reefs uh, was recognized as a BELMS uh, because uh, they can host uh, photosynthetic algae and provide a complex habitat structure. Uh, the layer of uh, rugosity is derived from the, uh, the uh, depth, depth data. It was based on the uh, depth variation of the cells around the uh, targeted cells. So, uh, so the uh, so the hair, the uh, the benthic roughness, and the, uh, the uh, normally the uh, hair the uh, biodiversity condition. And uh, the layer of within realm species richness is a uh, little complicated. It was synthesized from uh, species richness and uh, species and mesity realms. Uh, the, purpose, uh, the, the purpose of the synthesis is to know the condition of species richness within realm, within each realm. Uh, through comparing the species richness numbers uh, with, within the same realm rather than the ones from the other realms. Um, by including realms, uh, we can recognize regions of greatest uh, difference in uh, species composition. Uh, um, richness, the, uh, the species richness alone does not consider which species are present. Uh, after collecting the data layers, uh, they were introduced into the software zonation uh, for, uh, uh, for the uh, prioritization analysis. The, the basic algorithm of zonation is to iteratively remove cells from the lowest significant cells up to the highest ones. Uh, in this research, the uh, removal rule is the target-based function. Uh, this method prioritizes the cell which can contain the presence from multiple layers rather than a cell which only cover an, an extremely high cell value from a single layer. Uh, specifically, uh, because uh, yeah, to, uh, to satisfy the goal of this research, I set a target of 30% of each layer and, uh, and the uh, general analysis, which means uh, the, the highly prioritized areas are expected to cover 30% of each layer. So, uh, this is the uh, primary result of the prioritization analysis uh, uh, from the uh, light right to the dark right. Uh, they uh, represent the, uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the lowest to the highest in the 30% uh, per most highly prioritized areas. Uh, the prioritized areas were mainly located at the continental coasts, island arcs, oceanic islands, the Southwest Indian Ridge, the Northern Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Coral Triangle, Caribbean Sea, and the Arctic Archipelago. This post-analysis is to uh, test how well the, priorita the prioritized areas covered the layers used. Uh, the prioritized areas generally achieved 30% coverage on presence absence layers and fairly covered the top percent of globally covered layers. 
uh, these are the figures of the comparisons with current marine regions. Uh, only few prioritized areas were covered by current MPAs. Uh, for the no-take ones, the coverage was even less, 1%. Uh, therefore, more MPAs could be proposed based on the prioritized areas in A, B, and J's and the EEZs. So uh, uh, this is uh, further work uh, conducted by uh, Tamlin and uh, uh, trying to explore if we want to protect 30% thir uh, of the range of each threatened species, how much uh, area should, uh, sh uh, should be uh, protect worldwide. And uh, uh, the result uh, showed at least 40% of the ocean should be protect for an effective protection for the threatened species. Uh, in addition to the present, uh, in addition to the presented uh, work, uh, there are uh, uh, there are in total uh, five data driven marine priority uh, decisions. And uh, uh, if we want to do some uh, immediate um, uh, protection activity on, on global uh, on, on global scale, we can uh, we could uh, directly to uh, plan and uh, establish MPAs uh, in the uh, consensus uh, sites, and uh, there should be no doubt. I think, and uh, uh, in the second part, I would like to uh, uh, to to further talk talk about the work. Uh, in the West Pacific, uh, following the uh, similar approach, I did I mapped the surface ecosystems and the benthic ecosystems in the West Pacific region. Uh, the the study area in the West Pacific uh, re region uh, was delineated by the EEZs of each country and their uh, regions here, including the high seas in Philippine seas and the Tasman seas. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, from, and, uh, and based on the uh, ecosystem, uh, based on the ecosystem mapping, uh, we, we further export uh, their relations with uh, distribution uh, with species distribution and uh, uh, some uh, uh, some uh, some further relations between the uh, environments and uh, uh, species uh, community, species composition and uh, uh, richness here. Uh, this slide is an example. We export the relation between the temp uh, between the temperature and the species richness. Uh, the error size of each ecosystem and the richness in each ecosystem. And uh, uh, we can find in the West Pacific, uh, the temperature is uh, generally positively correlated with species richness, uh, similar to the condition uh, on uh, terrestrial ecosystems. And uh, uh, but uh, for the comparison between area size and uh, uh, richness, the uh, correlation uh, is not uh, obvious or uh, there is a, a, a slight negative uh, correlation between the size and uh, richness, not like the condition uh, in uh, terrestrial ecosystems. And uh, for now, we assume it may be uh, may because in uh, in the ocean the marine species uh, can uh, can move uh, more widely uh, than uh, terrestrial uh, species and uh, they have a wider distribution. Uh, this may be the reason. And uh, uh, similar to the global work, we also collected. The distribution of the four balms, uh, species richness, and the Bansdick city in the West Pacific region. And uh, 
uh, as Devinsha mentioned, uh, we can find uh, the uh, data of the four BELMs in the uh, UNEP WCMC Ocean Data Viewer uh, from this uh, data set. So uh, this is an uh, uh, initial analysis outcome of the uh, uh, biodiversity, bio, uh, biodiversity prioritization in the West Pacific. So in this prioritization analysis, it, uh, it covered the factors of uh, ecosystems, species richness, the uh, basic robustity and uh, uh, species admissibility balm, uh, and balms. And uh, uh, a similar post analysis was also conducted and uh, uh, the uh, list, analysis, list analysis also uh, well covered 30% of each present absence layers and uh, fairly uh, achieved the goal of uh, covering 30% of the uh, continuous layers. Uh, uh, this is a brief uh, compar uh, a comparison between the prioritized errors in the West Pacific and uh, the current MPAs, and uh, we can see that uh, so uh, for the no-take MPAs, uh, there is only a very small overlap. So, which means we may have to do some more work for an effective protection. And uh, in addition to the West Pacific, uh, uh, we are also trying to do some, uh, to, to do the regional scale work in other places such as the, the migrant seas uh, in uh, uh, Europe. And uh, uh, I, I, I and my team uh, members are collaborating with Mark Costello uh, to do uh, to do a similar project in the uh, European marginal seas, uh, adding some uh, local features and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, blue carbon factors, something like that. And uh, we are trying to do, yeah, want to see whether there could be anything different in uh, European seas. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lazao. It's really nice to see your work uh, because previously my work is only in the Coral Triangle region and now yeah. we have maps for whole whole world. Yeah, yeah and then it is really great that, yeah, there is a, I, yeah, I know that there is a 30 by 30 uh, movement that we need yeah. to protect 30% of our ocean in the next, in the 10, 2030. And now you have a Dr. Zhao provides us with very clear and very clear and very uh, 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 solution how where where to protect which are that need to protect if if you would like to achieve that thirty percent. Thank you, Dr. Zhao, for your presentation. You. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, 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 it is now uh, we are we are moving to the next steps of our uh, uh, seminar today. Uh, is uh, question and answer. I know, uh, uh, Dr. Zhao, if you would like to answer one question in the chat box, maybe you can answer it live. There is a question from Anthony Carlos that uh, I, I will read it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I yeah, see yeah. Maybe, question, maybe you can respond, yeah. Yeah, maybe you can respond uh, the, the answer first yeah. before we give the floor to other uh, uh, participants. Yeah, I'm reading the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for your question, uh, Antonio. And uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the approach I use for the prioritization analysis is, uh, uh, it is um, an open method. And uh, uh, in addition to the consideration of biodiversity conservation, you can add 
the other considerations in your specific project, such as you want to consider uh, social and uh, economic aspects, you can quantify them as data layers and uh, you can introduce them into the analysis, such as as the cost layer or uh, or a normal layer like the other uh, data layers pri uh, for prioritization. So I think that depends on what you uh, really need in your project. And uh, uh, so as far as I know, this uh, yeah, this uh, algorithm, this software can uh, can uh, they can contain uh, many much more <laughs> layers if you want. So I think that is not a um, um, problem. And uh, and once you can uh, sure what you want uh, from the local stakeholders, so you can introduce their, uh, their considerations in the analysis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Zhao, for your answer. OK. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, if there is any question from the participants, you may raise question now. We are in the question and answer session. Uh, there is a question from Takeshi Yamakita. Yeah, 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 actually from me. Yeah. So. The question is uh, about the data bias because uh, all of the data has biases, and uh, I, I think Jesse also mentioned it, it. It will be updated recently. So there is biases. Uh, did you use any indicator that uh, mitigate it, or do you have a suggestion to facilitate more to obtain more information or eliminate some taxa which are biases? What's the boss of you? Thank you, Takeshita. Uh, Dr. Jaya Tilaki, you want, you want uh, uh, respond to that question on bias of the data and how to mitigate uh, the bias? Yes, yeah, so this one is quite uh, interesting because when I worked on the seagrass, especially the seagrass is uh, showing a regional distribution, I should say like that. So uh, the specific uh, species live in a specific region. So this was a challenge for me to uh, avoid this data bias. And the other thing is like, there are lots of um, occurrence records come from the developed uh, or the temperate region than this in the Pacific region. Uh, especially the in Indian Ocean or the South Asian region, we don't have much records. So the problem was whether my uh, model is representing the real distribution or it biased towards the temperate region. So what I did to, uh, it's, a, it's very difficult to do a kind of like a normalization or this, because we have, the, I'm doing global level and every single record is uh, important. So what did I do? I tried to um, develop different types of models to see is there a really um, data bias uh, account in this model to see, see is there in a, an impact of this uh, uh, data bias. So. I selected the, the same number of, uh, or to the uh, latitude and uh, same number of occurrences for each latitude and try to do a model, but it didn't predict the distribution. So the real prediction or this, the, the final map was developed using all the occurrence records. I think because we have nearly, um, 40,000 occurrence records and the range is wider. So the environmental range is wider and this calculates the highest probability of occurrence. So it, uh, in my map, I didn't see any of this, um, the impact 
or the any side effect of the data bias. But I highly recommend so to not to go for the like because for the global conservation or to get a picture of global uh, distribution i developed this map but in my uh, paper research paper also i recommended it is better to do a local maps to the local models and then combine it then we can avoid this data bias or anything any kind of impact of the uh, the different environments or the, the impact from the different environments or the availability of records or something like that. But that was not happened to my uh, kelp biome because the kelps are temperate and we have enough uh, records for the um, kelps. Okay, the last one. <laughs> so the kelp biome is, um, it's temperate and we have enough records for temperate region. So that's how I handled. And the next question is like, where we can give more occurrence records or something like that. So I think uh, anyone can upload to GBIF or OBIS. There's a routine of, uh, or the process of uh, uh, submitting new occurrence records. Um, yeah. And I think you know more than that than myself because I uh, downloaded occurrence records from GBIF and OBIS, but uh, I think uh, you and uh, you know how to upload occurrence records to that. And are there any criteria to selection resolution just beyond the limitation of calculation time? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the I think the resolution time is depend on resolution or the, the resolution of a map depend on the objectives of your, is that the word? Are the, um, um, am I going to the next one? Uh, we can finish the, the first one first. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, and the more data in the future, or oh, where are some tax more bias than yeah. others? Which tax that you need to add more data? Yeah. Do you have any suggestion for that one? Sorry? Do you have any suggestion that which taxa that need to be more uh, data? Yes. So some uh, seagrass species. Overall, any uh, species in uh, Indo-Malayan or the other, around uh, South Asia, Indonesia, so this region, if we could get more occurrences, it's better because uh, if you uh, see the occurrence records of these uh, seagrasses, Indian Ocean is the least. In the West African region, we don't get enough uh, occurrences. So probably they are rare, but we don't get hmm, Yes, yeah, so a sufficient amount. So this is the, actually, this is the aim of my work to fulfill that gap from the outside um, occurrences and to, to, to draw uh, uh, polygons to see the possibilities of distribution. Yep. Thank it, you. Uh, Thank you, do you have anything yeah, to add? Kingsho, yeah, Kingsho, do you have any? Or Kingsho, can you oh, yeah. move to the next question on the spatial grid? Uh, also a question yeah, uh, the solution the, of your spatial the, grids then affect the, 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 the analysis because I know that you are more uh, 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 get to, get into the spatial grid. Uh, <laughs> we have a long discussion this kind. Okay, yeah. Can you yeah, explore yeah. more that one in, 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 in the Yeah, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, um, um, in my experience, uh, so the the, uh, the difficulty of uh, researching on a global scale, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, not many, uh, not much data can can be used on a global scale. So uh, such as as uh, Danisha mentioned, uh, in some uh, the areas are uh, surrounded by developed countries, so you can have uh, adequate data, but in somewhere else, uh it would be a challenge for a global scale data. So in such a situation, um, 
uh, usually uh, the uh, environmental data can be more easily collected from a remote sensing data set. It is uh, not a problem at present, I think. But the difficulty is the uh, how to collect uh, the uh, the um, um, biological data. So I think for the uh, for the the proper resolution, uh, it is uh, primarily depend on uh, the environmental data you 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 collected. I think, uh, yeah. To, uh, to be honest, for for myself, I did not meet a question of the the calculation time because uh, on a global scale, because uh, the true difficulty for me is the, the insufficient of available data. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is uh, on a global scale re research, and I think, uh, yeah. On a regional scale or a local scale, uh, uh, we we may choose a proper resolution to balance the accuracy and uh, calculation time. I think, yeah. And uh, I see a new question about how to contribute more data at local scale. Uh, I think uh, uh, you may have heard the data set. Uh, OBIS and uh, uh, GBIF. So uh, they are open sources and uh, uh, any uh, data contributor are after uh, um, a, a basic uh, eligibility assessment, I think they can contribute their own data to, uh, to the open source data set if they want. And the uh, and the data they contributed can, can be used for a local scale research and can also be used for a regional or a global scale research that depends on the users. So uh, if you have, uh, so if we want to contribute, my suggestion is you can try the OBIS data set and the GBRF data set. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Shao, for your, for your clarification on the data sources. Uh, is there any more questions to, the, to these two panelists? Yes, um, one person yeah. asked about resolution of the... Uh, yeah, the first slide. Oh, yeah, the limit, limit, limitation... Limitation solved. Of, so of, uh, resolution. I, yeah, mm, the, yeah, my idea yeah, my, is... Yeah. Uh, the for marine plants, it is better if we could go for 100 meter, 100 meter resolution, so that we uh, avoid the, the blank spaces coming to like one kilometer, one kilometer resolution. One kilometer, one kilometer resolution is like, it is a big area. And some places you can get this one kilometer distribution, but many places you don't get it, but it's added to your distribution area. So 100 kilometer, 100 meter, 100 meter resolution is enough for the, uh, the marine plants. You can get a kind of like approximate or more closer to the real value. But if you, it depends on the, what species you are working. So if you are going to, uh, and the distribution range of the species. And for example, like um, um, mapping huge forest areas, you don't want to get a 100 meter, 100 meter resolution. You can get, uh, when we talk about the uh, terrestrial uh, forest, probably like one kilometer, one kilometer is accurate but because the difference for the one kilometer is like we can consider, but for marine, 100 meter, 100 meter is better if you could go. And it depends on the range of the distribution of the specific species. If you're going to work like a snail species in this uh, little stream, there must be a very, very uh, finer resolution. Oh, and if you're going to work on the weather or something like that, that will be like a big uh, or the very coarse resolution. 
Yes. So this is my answer. Oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jayatulagi, uh, for yeah, your uh, yeah. to Thank adding you. information. Mm. So uh, in my own experience, if your uh, your research is on a global scale and uh, uh, is associated with uh, uh, biological factors and uh, environmental factors at the same time, I think a resolution of uh, 0 0.5 degree is sufficient. Uh, uh, is sufficient very much, I think, my, my own experience. Yep. Yep, I agree with you. Uh, two more questions on that? Oh, oh yes, I think we, yeah, we, the there are Yeah, I think we already answered, uh, Dr. Queen Charles already answered yeah. the, the uh, at local data set. Yeah. And, and then there's one oh, from Carlos, that... yeah, and the restoration yeah. project. Yeah, uh, is, it, is there any possibility to don't scale your data, your your uh, uh, biome data that we can fit to the local uh, restoration purposes? Oh, I think because this is a spatial distribution map, so it's very hard to use uh, the temporal changes. And the only thing is like we, the modern maps uh, depend on the existing point records. And uh, if there is a change for the future versions, that means we need more points and then that will be more accurate. But the best thing is to monitor restoration project is to use the satellite images and do a temporal change. I think that is the, the solution other than our biomaps. Our biomap has, the limitation to like, it's not a temporal updated ones. Even like we try to do it today, we have to depend on the existing records, but that is not a, it doesn't give any significant change to the, um, the model map. The only thing is you can use for seagrasses. There is a latest update of the uh, short, uh, Frederick Short's uh, map. Uh, it's updated 2021. You can use it. It's on the UNEP WCMC Ocean Data Weaver. You can use it, but it's also with the the uh, like uh, submitted uh, records. So yes, the best thing is you need to use satellite images and do an NDVI to get uh, the change. Cool. Thank you. That's that's yep. my opinion. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's that's what it's I really will cool do one. for that. Yeah. And yeah. I'm in Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jay Tlake, for your explanation. One. Yeah. Uh, there's one question for doc, uh, yeah. for Dr. Uh, 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 Zhao. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is about temperature. Sea water temperature. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, the uh, the current uh, research cover a large. Uh. uh a uh, geographical range uh, from the uh, very north to the very south across all the West Pacific. So it do cover the uh, temperate and uh, uh, traffic areas. And uh, uh, this is the current uh, result we found. And uh, we are exploring the, the rule or logic behind the, uh, the analysis outcome and uh, uh, yeah I'm not uh, really sure uh, whether it relate uh, it related to the recent uh, warming and uh, uh, yes oh uh, we are yeah we are also trying to collect it uh, pre uh, predicted uh, environmental variables in the West Pacific and uh, to see uh, would there be any 
interesting variation under different uh, climate change uh, scenarios and uh, uh, yeah and uh, how the ecosystems would vary in their uh, environmental uh, variables values or the associated species distribution. Yeah, we are still exploring. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Yeah, uh, all these things is... Uh, is there any more questions? Yes, I'm, I'm answering one question for the... Yeah, like... you're writing to answer. Yeah. Yep. It's the same one already. Answered. Yeah, it's the same one. Well, yeah, you already you already responded to that one on the restoration project, Doctor J. Tilaki. So, yeah, uh, participants and the panelists, we have seen that the opportunity to use the point of occurrence data record to develop a model, process distribution model, to to point out where is the location for the uh, developing the MPAs, uh, and then there are a number of points that we discussed today from the technical part is very uh, nice discussion on how to which resolution that you can use from local uh, regional to, to 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 global and what what kind of data set that we can use to develop that one uh, that we, we have to realize that there is an underrepresentation of our data sets in global in global data sets there is a spatial uh, uh, a spatial scale underrepresentation there is a record based uh, underrepresentation there is a temporal uh, uh, scale of underrepresentation that that we have to, yeah. That's the best data that we have that available now. Then we can use that one. Uh, Doctor Jaya Tilake and Doctor Kwang Zhao uh, 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 shows how the, and shows a, a result of their of their project of their research that we can use that data set to develop a really nice uh, 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 result, a really nice uh, uh, formulation that yeah. This is the area that we can develop our uh, MPA or marine toxic area. Uh, I think this might, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's not a conclusion for our discussion today. Uh, see you on next Friday and get back the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the host. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all uh, healthy and luck. Thank you, Dr. Sao. Thank you, Dr. Dinusha. Thank it's you. really nice to meet you. Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Masa And uh, Juan Carlos. Thank, Thank you very, you much, very for your... much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank See you, you next, very much. in the next yeah. meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a great yeah. session. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Bye. Uh, bye. King uh, you, yeah. uh, Hang on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, King Shao and Dinusha. Do you have like a, a, a phone number or, or WhatsApp number so we can contact you directly? Because it's so hard to contact you by uh, email then. Yeah, I have a, yeah, uh, I have a Can I share with you now? You. Is uh, it still online? <laughs> hang on. On live streaming? On your streaming? Um, uh, hang on. Yeah, I, I think 